Good morning. Welcome to this morning's research results presentation on non-invasive detection and identification of eastern hellbender in Ohio surface waters using environmental DNA. I'm Victoria Beale with the LTAP Center here in Ohio and I have as our presenter today Dr. David Wendell who's a PhD at the University of Cincinnati. Um, but before I turn things over to Dr. Wendell, I just want to remind everyone that if you have questions while the presentation is occurring, there is a question box in the GoToWebinar panel, and we would ask that you please enter them there. Dr. Wendell will be stopping periodically throughout his presentation to take questions, and at that point in time, I'll read off any questions that are in the box as time allows. So with that, I believe that's all the housekeeping items I have. Dr. Wendell, are you ready? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Victoria. Um, so as Victoria mentioned, uh, my name is David Wendell. Um, I'm an associate professor of environmental engineering at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I have a secondary appointment in biomedical engineering. And um, eDNA is a nice kind of in-between for me because it's, it's, an, it's an environmental um, component, but there's also a lot of molecular biology. So it, it fits really nicely in, in some of the things that we do in my lab. Um, the program manager for this project was uh, Chris Steering. He was also, um, you know, a technical advisor in steering some of the research that that um, I think that helped. Um, this is obviously sponsored by the Ohio Department of Transportation. And um, with that, I will start slides. Oh, it's not working. Hold on. Sorry. Oh, no. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so the goal, as the, the title um, demonstrated, is we were looking to make <clears throat> or you know develop a non-invasive non-invasive method for um, you know detecting hellbenders. And I think you know one of the things that we were bringing to the table is hopefully a way to identify animals, so individual animals, um, and there has been um, a lot of work to date with eDNA and identification, um, or at least detection uh, of different types of animals. Um, and so with, you know, I'll, I'll go over some of that um, research at the beginning, but we had, when we started this, a couple of big questions um, that we wanted to answer with our work. And um, hopefully, uh, you know, the, the data I showed today will we'll, we'll go over that and, and convince you that we've maybe answered some of these. Um, you know, what are the limitations of detection? So, you know, the, there's an obvious question of, uh, you know, detection limit. You know, how uh, far away can we detect these animals? Um, you know, what's the, the lowest concentration we can detect in a stream? Um, stream parameters, how they influence the detection. Um, again, there's been some, some background research on this, um, but we, you know, kind of, we did our, some of our own and, and confirmed uh, some of the existing work. Uh, also how uh, time of day and season might affect how we're detecting the animals. Um, you know, where should we sample in the stream? Uh, one of the, the major goals of this method was to provide a means of, um, you know, field work that would allow uh, folks to 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 find and locate you know these animals. So it just it's a we we approach this you know from an engineering point of view of of making and developing a practical um, method that somebody can reproduce and um, and use. And and I know that there's a lot of you know I've run into this many times in like in biology where you you have you know, methods that are written in papers and, and they don't always work, the, you know, the way that, that, that you'd like them to or the way they're described. So I'm hoping that, you know, what I described today is robust enough for, you know, everyone that's interested in, um, it looks like we have uh, 57 attendees, so hopefully some of you out there will be interested in, in repeating this work and trying out our primer sets. Um, how far downstream, so that was the sort of goes along the lines of limited detection. And then lastly, and this was uh, one of the pieces that um, I hope will, will be interesting to many of you, uh, how can the hypervariable region of the mitochondrial DNA tell us more about um, where the animals are, more than just presence, absence? Can it tell us uh, something about how many are there? 
So um, I'll show you some of the data that we got for that. Uh, I don't think um, most of the folks in attendance need a, a background on the Eastern Hellbender, but um, I, I just have one slide with a few bullet points here. Um, the animal is native to Ohio and um, a large section of Appalachia. Um, it's also uh, in Missouri and, and Georgia, and it once had an abundant population, but that has decreased significantly. Um, and there's uh, probably a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, one of those reasons is that the habitat um, is be, uh, becoming uh, uh, reduced from farming practices and you know some of the modern waterway engineering. These animals are habitat specialists, so they seek out um, really specific uh, habitats, uh, rivers that are that are flowing, uh, fast flowing, well oxygenated, um, silt free, rocky bottoms, um, and as runoff and other things um, you know put silt into their environment, it, it reduces where these animals can can live and reproduce. Um, part of the strategy with eDNA is to assess these habitats for range, um, but uh, you know, but this work, you know, the animals are not currently federally listed, and I know, um, you know, many of you probably have uh, a concern about that. I know I do. Um, I was disappointed that it, it was not federally listed, but it, it is uh, an, an animal that we need to protect and. Um, you know, hopefully this method of eDNA detection will, will contribute to that. Um, a little background on eDNA. Again, I think many of you um, will, will have some of this knowledge already, but the, uh, e, you know, eDNA, DNA existing in the environment, this can consist of um, genomic DNA, uh, mitochondrial DNA, um, the origins for the eDNA include feces, you know, saliva, urine, um, gametes, sloth skin cells. These are um, anything the animal is, you know, producing, and we're able to capture uh, in the water. eDNA has been used to detect a number of animals. This in this list is growing uh, different types of amphibians, uh, fish, um, reptiles, uh, anthropods, mammals. Uh, it's becoming a really useful strategy as people do more work with it and improve um, the methods and the primer sets. Uh, mitochondrial DNA is an attractive target uh, specifically amongst the available eDNA uh, because there's a larger number of copies, uh, so there's a larger number of targets. And mitochondrial DNA um, is a little bit more robust. So because they're organelles within the cell, they um, decay at a different rate than the genomic DNA when the cells, you know, when a, when a eukaryotic cell is sliced. Um, highly conserved within species, so that makes identification uh, possible with mitochondrial DNA. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a robust detection that's from the, the survivability of the, of the DNA in the environment. So, um, we like mitochondrial DNA. We have used this in the past for other work, um, and I'll talk a little bit about you know some of the work we've done with human mitochondrial DNA in, in a moment. Um, so getting back to those questions, you know, where do we want to sample in the stream? Some uh, researchers have have looked into this, and um, and specifically for amphibians, there was a group. Um, in Japan, that, that looked at the salamander um, locations, the clawed salamander, studying uh, stones, surface, uh, water, and at different depths. So they found there was, you know, a distribution. They, there was you know, some very concentrated hits when you're when you're uh, measuring from surface samples, um, and then there was a, a nice distribution when you're doing surface waters. Um, Victoria, can, can everybody see my cursor? Sorry, yes, they can. It's hovering right, over your cool. chart. Um, so this is um, this is where we're operating. You know, we're we're hoping to get these sorts of numbers um, when we're doing our work, and 
the the nice thing about surface water is you can you know get in there with a with a you know with a liter bottle do a grab sample it's quick you know you're not getting down to the surface depending on how deep you know the, the river is or the creek is you know the the stone or the surface may be sort of tough to get down without you know maybe a snorkel or something else so uh, for our for our work you know the surface water is the most convenient but it also has this nice distribution um, you know of, of eDNA um, throughout the volume so this group collected one liter samples five liter samples um, you know they were they were kind of looking at, at how the distribution of eDNA uh, appeared in the, in the water column and you know for our work we were, we were uh, collecting one liter samples we found you know one liter was adequate for many of the detection events that we needed um, and and they found as we did that this one liter sampling of the surface water was particularly useful for stream bed dwelling species and uh, just like our hellbender uh, seasonal variation um, we found that uh, August September were some of the best times to to, to detect the animals um, this was found also confirmed by, by another group uh, they tested also because the animals um, are nocturnal or, or they're, they're they're very active at night um, there is also uh, eDNA to be captured during the day so that's very convenient because then you're not you know sampling in the middle of the night um, and uh, we you know we were we we stuck to that schedule just you know daytime sampling um, we found that uh, yeah again one liter in, in uh, September was probably the best time we did uh, get some detects during the early part of the summer um, but generally speaking um, it was very difficult or you know maybe I'm not going to say impossible because you know, but it, it was very difficult to detect anything, um, you know, November, you know, through April or May. It was, it was, you know, it was very difficult to to see any. Even if we knew the animals were there, we we were we had some difficulty detecting them. Um, past surveys. So where does our work fit in to, um, you know, the overall? Uh, surveys done in, in the Midwest in this area too. Um, there have been past work, there was past work done in West Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio. I've listed the two papers at the bottom here. Um, 16 sites, um, six with unknown. Uh, so they got this was a, this was the work I'm referencing here is the one on the right, West Virginia. They had um, 16 sites um, with hits, um, six that were Previously unknown uh, animals were located. They give the the dates, um, so they were able to get something in in spring, um, and and also confirming later summer is is uh, seems to supply more more hits. Um, one liter detection, the same that we were doing or we are, are doing, two PCR um, as the uh, detection mode and. Um, one interesting result, and this was also found by another group. There was no correlation between the hellbender eDNA concentration and animal abundance, um, which, you know, in my opinion, was was surprising. Um, they also had the, the the they also had another finding that I found surprising. Um, they I mean, they mentioned this in the paper that their deionized water was was positive. Uh, so they had, you know, they mentioned some some work they were doing to find good negative controls. Um, so both of these studies were using a, a site B uh, primers. So the, the the mitochondrial DNA target that is just to you know just to the right of where we're, we're um, targeting. So I'll show you that in a moment. Um, is there? I'll stop here for just a question. Is there anyone that um, has a question on this? Is sort of a review so far, but um, you know the. The papers or the work that was done um, that I'm referencing. Are there any questions on that so far? Dr. Wendell, there's no questions to this point. Okay. Oh, wait a minute, yeah. one just popped in. Hold on. Okay. All right. If eDNA is detected for the species, how does one know if the eDNA quote unquote originated from miles upstream? 
In other words, could the eDNA be present at a specific location, but the species really is not present? Right. Yeah, so that question is it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, so that talk that the, the real question there is, is the survivability of eDNA in the stream. So, you know, for, for our work, we found a decay rate um, that would put the detectability of eDNA within about 300 to 500 feet. And I'll show you a graph of that. So that is to say, if the animal is more than about 500 feet upstream, uh, we, we couldn't detect it. So um, that, that's going to depend a lot on the stream conditions and the flow rates and how much it's diluted, how much it decays. Um, but yes, keep in mind that the DNA that is in the stream does decay. Um, and we've seen this with human mitochondrial DNA in a lot of different situations. Um, it's degraded by uh, bacteria and you know, they're recycling the, you know, the, the phosphates and they're, um, they're, the, degrade, the decay rate um, is dependent on a number of different things. The temperature we found is a big factor and um, oxygen levels. And, and so I'm gonna say that the survivability of the eDNA in the stream is gonna be stream dependent um, but in our work, we've seen, you know, on the order of hundreds of feet from the animal. So, okay. uh, so why do we like mitochondrial DNA as an e-target? So it's or e DNA target. So it's a it's a robust uh, target because there's multiple copies per cell. So if you have you know, one cell released, if you had a genomic target, um, you know, ribosomal genes, there are genes with multiple copies per, you know, per genome. Um, mitochondria are very nice for you because you can have hundreds of copies, to thousands of copies per cell. So that provides orders of magnitude, um, you know, greater potential target. Um, and and it's, it, because it's its own organelle, it's actually sort of encased it's just, you know, you can kind of think of it as a cell within a cell. Now, I know that the traditional sort of beam that you might see in, a, in an image from a, from a bio book, that's sort of gone away, right? We know now mitochondria are this, these interconnected organelles within a cell. So it's not these independent, you know, beam-shaped uh, mini cells. They're, they're the, a network of interconnected cells. But um, still, they have multiple copies per cell and, and many more copies that, that, that allow them to uh, be a useful target. Um, I mentioned before that those two papers uh, that looked at um, you know, tracking hellbenders in, in, in Ohio and Kentucky, West Virginia, um, and other places have used uh, Cytochrome B as uh, their target. And that's shown here um, in the upper right. Um, and we started with those primers, uh, at least um, one of the set that was published in 2014, and I'll talk about those. Cytochrome um, B is an excellent target. It, 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 uh, it's used for a lot of different animals. Um, it's used because it's conserved, and it can be um, very informative on what, what Cytochrome B you're amplifying. So that is to say, you can identify the, the animal um, or the insect even, you know, other um, other organisms by using cytochrome B. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of history of, of building phylogenetic trees using cytochrome B. So I think that is one of the reasons why it's a, it's a you know, kind of a preferred target people have been using it for a little while. Um, we, in my work, we, we like um, the D-loop region. And the reason we like the D-loop region is because uh, it has a lot, what I, what I like to consider a lot more information. Um, with our goal being, you know, potentially identifying the animal, um, you know, our strategy is to not only amplify a chunk of DNA from the mitochondrial genome that we can say this is unique to Hellbender, but also what information can we derive from that presence? So that is to say, we, we amplify a piece of the genome. We know that it's Hellbender from the sequence, but is there more information that we can use in that sequence to maybe identify individual animals? And that's the reason we chose the D-loop region as it's you know, uh, 
abbreviations that are implied is the hypervariable region. The, the mutation rate for the hypervariable regions of the mitochondrial genome orders of magnitude higher than other portions um, of, the, of the mitochondrial genome. And that can be really useful if you're trying to, um, you know, kind of develop a table of what they call haplotypes, um, which is, you know, as many probably on here know, it's just kind of a fancy word for, you know, d d dividing up uh, individuals um, and, and on, on, on maternal lines. So for our work, we were just looking to develop a way of identifying animals and, and distinguishing animals. Um, and seeing if it was possible to use the D loop, knowing that these animals are their mitochondrial diversity is relatively monomorphic. So um, the the mitochondrial genome here, and I have a couple of traits. If you, if you haven't heard this before, but it's um, it is maternally inherited. So um, you know any children that share a mother should have the same mitochondria. Um, assuming there, you know, is no uh, mutations between a uh, mother and child or within the, or within the individual. Um, animal population, it's been used in the past for animal populations and uh, evolutionary studies, as I mentioned. Um, you can distinguish between sampling sites based on sequence uh, variability. Um, and past work for my lab has, has used that sequence variability to um, evaluate uh, anthropogenic inputs in environmental waters. So we had um, a case study in an urban watershed where we were looking at, you know, hu basically human waste entering um, these creeks and, and determining where, you know, the largest inputs of sewage were coming from based on, um, you know, based on the sequences. So um, that's really, you know, the case for using mitochondrial DNA as an eDNA target and specifically the D-loop. So um, are there any questions on the D-loop or you know, why, why we chose that? There are no questions in the question box at this time. Okay. So um, again, just a little primer on, on that. What I just mentioned with human DNA, we used and targeted the, the hypervariable region too. So if I go back, this is um, the region on the right there. Uh, what we did was we collected um, rain events, you know, low flow events. We collected a, lar a large number of samples from um, urban creeks in the Cincinnati area and extracted um, DNA and, and, and were targeting human hypervariable region DNA. And then um, we aligned this DNA and looked at what they call SNPs or, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, and I realized that technically, you know, some of these repeats are, are not SNPs, but we kind of lumped in, you know, any mutations uh, that we were picking up with these um, sequences. We just, we call them SNPs or deviations from the reference sequence. So, you know, without getting into the sort of the minutia of, of the technical definition of, of SNPs, I, I, that's broadly what we were doing in, in so we would we would extract the DNA from these water samples, um, look at the mitochondria, and we had a lot of variability. So there was obvious, you know, the the streams are impacted by you know raw sewage from uh, rain events, and you know obviously the municipal sewage has a lot of different people contributing to it. So unsurprisingly, we had uh, a, a, a large variety of SNTs that we could pick up. Um, what we did was we then uh, mapped those. So we, we take the frequency of a particular mutation. So again, here you can see on this picture, the C's, for example, that are, that are highlighted blue, the G's and the T's, those are um, deviations from the reference sequence. So those are what we're talking about when we talk about SNPs. We can put those into a frequency table and, and make what they call a heat map. So this was just a table of these SNPs and their and their frequency um, reported in color form. So darker is more frequent and lighter is less frequent. Um, you can see from each sampling site here at the top that we had unique SNP signatures for each sampling site. Okay. So getting um, 
water directly, you know, that's leaking out of these combined sewer overflows, and then looking at what SNP frequencies we see in the um, bulk water in the in the water downstream, we can actually trace back or you know indicate which CSOs we think are the largest contributors. Um, you know, you can take this one step further and cluster those sequences uh, and see if there's you know, a relationship between the water you're finding in the creek and the SNPs that you're picking up from the sewage. And we did that and, and we, we found that these, you know, CSOs were clustering in specific areas. Um, and, you know, you could take this even further and, you know, as one of my colleagues joked, you know, you could sequence a, an individual mitochondrial genome and send them a bill for, you know, for, their, for their leaking sewage. But, that's not what we did here. We were we were we were looking to send anybody a bill. We were looking to find a fingerprint for, you know, in this case, uh, sewage impacting an urban creek, and that could tell um, the local uh, sewer district which CSOs were the worst contributors and which ones they should you know prioritize in terms of fixing. Um, so this was a study we did. Um, a number of years ago, and so that's really where I was approaching the Hellbender um, identification, uh, where we're we're still targeting the hypervariable region. Um, there is a lot less diversity with you know that animal's mitochondrial genome, you know, due to evolutionary bottlenecks and so forth. Um, you know, one thing though that I want to get and mention during our talk here is is there is um, the possibility that one organism can have multiple copies of a mitochondrial genome. And that, that um, property or trait is called heteroplasmy. So I'll talk about that in, in, in a minute. Um, heteroplasmy, specifically with amphibians, uh, the only literature I could find on this, and please, if there's people in the audience that, that have um, some more data on this, you know, I'm happy to. to hear about it. We found um, only one paper that were supported heteroplasmy in amphibians, and it was a hybrid uh, frog of the European marsh frog. And and that's not you know really unexpected if you're if you're if you're a hybrid animal, you, you're gonna have um, you know potentially two two different genomes. So that was uh, the one uh, example of, of heteroplasmy that we found, but Right along the same lines uh, with hypervariable region or D-loop um, investigations as a means of identification, we've, we've, we saw this paper um, that was uh, very recent in the last uh, couple of years, whether so we have one from 2020, but there was a paper that discussed the D-loop uh, with green sea turtles and that, that has the same problem that um, Cryptobranches does. It, it has a, a low frequency haplotype, so so it's relatively monomorphic um, overall in the mitochondrial genome. What they did was they they targeted a very specific portion of the DLIP that has you know repeat you know repeat regions, and they were able to develop um, you know 30 in the paper were 33 haplotypes from what you know before was simply just a a single haplotype, you know, so they had one haplotype for for all of the Mediterranean green sea turtles, and they were able to turn that into 33 um, by targeting a very specific region. And, and um, my assumption there is that when when folks are sequencing their mitochondrial genomes, they're, they're maybe not sequencing all of the genomes or the whole thing. So that that was that was uh, my assumption on how they were able to to achieve that greater specificity. Um, but the, the thing I liked about that paper was that it, it, it demonstrated, um, you know, uh, help in discerning, discerning a population uh, of animals. They you know obviously turtles are reptiles, not amphibians, but um, it did demonstrate a, a um, approach that we were using and supported the idea that, um, that we could maybe find more information from. From hellbenders <clears throat> in the region that then currently existed, so that was um, something that encouraged us. So, you know, the takeaway was for low diversity mitochondrial DNA, D 
the D-loop region can be a really nice choice for detection and animal identification because it potentially has more information. And uh, more inf what I mean by more information is it has, since it has a greater propensity for mutation, you have a greater probability of finding unique um, sequences in that region. Okay. Were there any questions on that so far? So. Yes. They, my... Did the turtle paper use eDNA for their inference? They did. Yeah. That's it. Um, okay, um, so I'm just going to touch on this briefly. This was our very first work. Um, we started with a primer set that was published in um, a couple of different places, and it seemed to be uh, something that appeared robust based on um, some of the published work. You know, that unfortunately wasn't our finding, um, and I just want to you know, say early on that this, you know, this is just our experience. It doesn't mean the primers don't work. It doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not calling into question anybody's results. What I'm just, I want to report here is just our results, uh, you know, with our efforts trying to trying to use this primer set. So um, when we used the, the previously reported, so when people were surveying in Ohio and Kentucky and West Virginia, they used the primer set that I've, that I've shown at the top, it's a degenerate primer set, so those R's, um, those represent either an A or a G. Um, the probe here, a TACMAN probe, we use exactly the same TACMAN probe. Um, you know, we had the, we had the primers um, synthesized by Eurofin, the probe is synthesized by IDT. Um, uh, I think they have, uh, the kind of the market cornered on the minor groove binding. Uh, Attribute. I don't know if anyone else can speak to that. That's the only company I could find that would make that. But um, we use those primers in a number of different samples when we were starting out, and um, really weren't able to get a lot from them. Um, we were fortunate enough to have positive control samples from the Columbus Zoo, so we were able to, with the help of, of Greg Lips and, and some folks at the Zoo, we were able to, um, obviously Greg Lips is part of the Hellbender Consortium, um, we were able to get um, tank water and animal swabs. Uh, so we used the nitrocellulose swab and, and you know, rubbed it on the animal's surface and, um, and extract DNA from those as positive controls for the animal. Um, we tried uh, a lot of different conditions for trying to make these work. And um, we found that the, the biggest problem I think we found was that there really just it wasn't amplifying uh, at all, really. Uh, it, this picture on the left here shows you kind of what we were getting, but, you know, not, almost nothing. We were using Q5 and we we're also using the Kaijin Quantitech, which is the, which was the reported multi-mix, uh, the, sorry, master mix that, um, that there was used. We had an applied, uh, applied bio system 7500, which is also the instrument they reported that they used. Um, so we truly were fully used the exact cycling conditions and everything, and um, just, you know, we couldn't get much out of it. So um, as a result, um, you know, we, you know, wanted to test our DLU primers. We were hoping this could be, you know, sort of our backup where if we didn't detect anything with our hypervariable region primers, we could always, you know, try to detect something with this, this cytochrome B primers, but um, because there was non-specific amplification, uh, you can see that at the top a little bit, there's a little bit of smear at the top. Um, on the left gel here, uh, we were concerned that some of this might be a problem. Now the probe, the TACMAN probe should take care of that. But um, you know, when we were using this in the qPCR instrument on the right, we just weren't getting uh, much of a signal. So. Yeah, so for those reasons, for, for, we got some non-specific amplification, and maybe that's, you know, um, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to take down anybody's work. I'm, I'm just suggesting maybe the, the earlier paper that had, you know, positive hits in their deionized water, maybe that has something to do with the primer set. Um, but regardless, this the, 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 the value to eDNA is still there, so, you know, that doesn't mean these primers won't work in somebody else's hands, um, but, you know, um, you know, it wasn't our experience. So 
So we are really focused on trying to develop our own primer sets, and, and we spent a lot of time on this. Um, you know, we tried at least nine different primer sets. And when I say testing a primer set, we're talking, you know, 50 to 60 or more reactions under different conditions um, in, in for each primer set. So, so thermal, different thermocycling conditions, you know, different magnesium, different, you know, we all know the different variables you can, you can um, you know, tweak on PCR. And, and we've, we tried all of them. <laughs> so, you know, different master mixes. Um, and and uh, we, we found that we, we, we got to the point where the, the, straight, the, the amplification of the hypervariable region worked, but it would still give us a little bit of a smear. And so we went to a nested approach. So I think everybody that's done PCR is familiar with nested PCR. Um, you know, there's simply a primer set that binds within a primer set. So that allowed us to clean up non-specific amplification um, and get this, you know, result kind of here in the center where we were getting about a 200 base pair amplicon um, that uh, that was pretty clean for for our purposes. And the the value of that is that you know it's this 200 base pair we can then sequence and see if there's if there's more information we can derive from it. So I'm giving you, I'm showing you here uh, gels that are, you know, working gels. These are, are, you know, I know everybody likes to show their best gels. Um, I'm hope, I'm hopeful that you know, showing some of our, you know, non-perfect gels will, um, you know, encourage you to try our primer sets and see if they work for you. Um, the last gel here on the right, I'm showing you. This was directly taken from the sequencing efforts um, at, that I'm going to talk about at the very end. So. Um, you know, am I doing that time? Okay, so um, that was that was our our work. We spent a lot of time developing primer sets, and then we and then we were um, go, going out into the field and trying these. So the first places we tried them uh, were, were Salt Creek and Sidel Brush Creek, um, sort of in, in, towards central Ohio. These locations were chosen um, upon the recommendation of Greg Lips. These were uh, where there were known uh, there was a known animal release. Uh, or at least a suspected animal located there um, from from the Help Vendor Consortium. So these were um, locations that were provided to us, um, and we had um, the best results for Salt Creek. Um, the, those are shown uh, here. So the nested primer set um, really produced some nice, clean, you know, 200 base pair bands. Um, on uh, the positive controls uh, and our and our, our um, you know and our field samples for Salt Creek and Santa Brush Creek, we did have you'll notice here this is a little bit more dim. We did have trouble picking up the Santa Brush Creek animal, so this was not something we were able to um, do this detection downstream because we we only found it um, at pretty much just one location in Santa Brush Creek. We didn't have concentration, you know, variable concentrations. We just had, you know, fun spots. The, <clears throat> the Salt Creek was different. It afforded us the ability to uh, do different concentration measurements downstream. And someone asked you earlier, you know, how how do we know the animal's DNA is related to, um, you know, the, the detection that we're picking up? And I mentioned that it decays, and this was our decay rate. So we. Um, had a, a single animal release that we knew of because of because um, they had a habitat that I think they installed near the bridge and so we were we were we never actually physically saw the animal we were this is all from eDNA creek water so this was at site the first site which is up here um, site one was right next to the bridge um, sorry um, this here is site three. And so forth down, down, and you can see over the course, you know, of just 300 feet, we lose a lot of our concentration. So, in you know, contrast to what some other folks have found, we did find a concentration dependence, at least from the distance, uh, not you know, necessarily animal abundance. At this point, we're just looking at um, you know, downstream distance of detection. Um, and which trails off to close to undetectable uh, down here. Um, so when 
we're about a third of a mile downstream, we, we are not able to detect this anymore. Um, so we use that to inform our sampling uh, efforts in the future. So we try to take samples roughly 300 feet apart to try to make sure we weren't skipping over an animal or something like that. So um, are there any questions on this first? This, this was the first results we got for um, our primer set. There are a couple of questions that have come in while you've been speaking. Okay. Um, the most recent one was how long after the animal releases were the samples taken? Um, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't know for sure, but I know that it was on the order of months to a year. So um, it was very, and, and maybe others have found this, it was very difficult for my group to, to get information on released animals. Um, and I know it's, you know, the animals are protected. So this was something where we got the coordinates, you know, kind of like a, like a, like a treasure map and, uh, and went there. We weren't really given a lot of information on, you know, how long they've been there or, you know, yeah. So it was, uh, I, I guess that's a long way of saying I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I believe if my memory serves, it was, you know, months. To, to a year, it was, it was, they've been there for a little while. Okay, and the other question came pretty early in this segment, but I'm gonna read it anyway. It says, what is the cost to run eDNA analysis on a single 1L grab sample? Would the multiple grab samples from a single site be necessary to ensure confidence in the eDNA results, or are multiple subsamples taken from the single 1L? Excellent. Those are, those, are, those are great questions. So the cost is, um, we have our cost listed in our final report. Um, so if you want to, you can check that out for, the, for all of the numbers. Um, but we had, with extractions, um, PCR, and sequencing, we had the cost at a couple thousand dollars. So 3000 I think, um, if, if sequencing was desired. Um, per sample location. Now, um, can you get multiple samples from one leader? I mean, you can. Generally, we use um, one leader, we filter one leader, and I'll get to the methods part where we get, um, we get that uh, all on one membrane and, and, and extract it from that. So we'll get essentially one DNA grab, if you will, from one leader. Um, but, you know, it's possible to split it up, I guess. But we, would you would you have would multiple samples provide you know a more 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 information? I think so. Yeah. So you know, would I recommend getting multiple samples only if you're you know you need to locate the animal and you're not locating the animal but you're picking it up on the eDNA. So that is to say, if you pick up a really strong signal and you can't find the animal, then uh, yeah, then you may want to go back and and, and do some more grab samples to see if you know if you can locate it. Um, yeah, so that that I do think multiple samples can be valuable, but generally speaking, I would do you know one sample in in these surveys um, within you know 300 feet ish uh, to see if if you can pick them up. No further questions at this time. Okay. Um, well, the next step we did, so then we had. Uh, you know, we we were fortunate. We had we had you know these these amplicons. So we had DNA that we amplified from zoo animals and the animals in the field. And um, the next thing we want to look at was does this dealers have any you know information? And you know, as you would expect, almost all of these animals uh, were the mitochondrial dealer region that we were amplifying was the same. Um, and that wasn't unexpected because the animals in Salt Creek, um, and that's that's shown here, um, down here, and were this was known to be an animal derived from the same um, mother or clutch, I think, of, of the, as, the, as the animals that we were um, looking here. So maybe you know, maybe that gives us a time frame for for how long the animal been there, but that. Um, the, the, the surprising result that we had from this was actually that within the zoo animals, so this, this was sequencing results we got strictly for 
you know, individual animals that we swabbed, we had one with a a different uh, one mutation at base pair 59 in our in our amplicon. And over here, you can see this is the sang. This was these are all sangaries. The, the the base call is definitely you know a G, and you know this was derived from PCR um, of that individual animal swap. You know, so we were able to do this multiple times and, and verify that this was in fact a base pair change. So, um, you know, how did this animal that is that has got the same mother derive a mutation? You know, it, it, this is just a, a, a case of heteroplasmy, right? So this has uh, uh, a mutant from from an existing uh, mitochondrial line that we know of. So the the result here, you know, it, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions. I think, you know, how do we know um, that this isn't, isn't a sequencing error? How do we know this isn't a PCR error? And the answer to that is you just got to do it multiple times, right? You got to sequence it multiple times. You got to do PCR from the template multiple times and sequence those. So it just requires work. So that's that's how you can answer if that is a legitimate mutation. Um, the This gave us, again, more, this helped us, encourage us to to continue with this approach. Um, you know, this was one of the big questions, and you know, I really appreciate Chris Staring for for kind of believing in this approach that it might work. And I know there's a, a lot about a lot of you out there, and maybe haven't convinced you yet, but I hope by the end of this, I will because I have a, a few more high throughput sequencing results um, that this can be a useful uh, metric for for identifying animals. Um, I'll quickly go over our sampling procedure because. I'm, I'm running a little bit low on time here, but um, so we, and this is not, this doesn't deviate largely from what other groups have published, but we collect one liter samples in Nalgene bottles. These bottles are um, cleaned, rinsed, and autoclaved. Uh, these then go out in the field. We collect um, grab samples. Um, you know, we shoot for the middle of the water column, um, you know, kind of based on that, that, uh, that salam the previous salamander paper, the Claude salamander. Um, we have the bottles put on ice after we sample. Um, this is something you know I think a lot of a lot of people do. We found <clears throat> when we were doing this with human mitochondrial DNA that we the, the, the samples would decay, um, would change um, within uh, hours if they were left just warm. So it's very important to keep them cold. It's very important to process them in our, you know, experience within six hours of getting them if you can. Um, if you can't, then you know that's just the way it is. But that we we made every effort to to filter them. When I say process, I mean filter them. Get the get the the DNA onto a filter um, so it's not going to be easily degraded by microbes. And then uh, you know freeze or store that filter in a, in a fridge if, if you don't have a freezer available. Until the DNA extraction, um, we recorded stream conditions, GPS locations, and then, as I said before, we were shooting for around 300 feet or less from from each site. Um, and then, uh, yeah, four degrees to ensure um, bacterial organisms. So they were kept at four degrees when we were transporting them. Once they were filtered, they were kept at minus 20 before or or minus 80 before uh, the DNA extractions, and then after that, the DNA was kept at four degrees. So we, we wanted to avoid freeze thaws freeze, uh, when we were, um, you know, using the, the, the eDNA for PCRs. Any questions so far on our sampling or any of the stuff I've covered? Yes, there was an additional question um, sure. regarding whether taking a, a single sample is appropriate. They wanted to know um, if this is regardless of water levels. Oh. Um, no, no. I mean, the, the water. So we. I'll get to the, some of the stream condition limitations. Is water conditions are very important when you're when you're going to sample. Um, we've had, you know, anything basically anything that deviates from low flow. Um, we had very very challenging time detecting it. So any rain events, um, you know, any uh, large flow, you know, so maybe in the spring. Um, it made it very difficult to detect um, animals, you know, like, for example, my example would be the Blue River, where we knew animals were. Um, so, yeah, so you, if you all have to sample in higher flows, 
then yes, absolutely, you're going to want to take multiple samples. But I would say there's probably diminishing returns, or you know, it may not be particularly useful to sample at high flow times. Um, if the creek or river just has happens, you know, just by what nature of its size and drainage area, it has a high flow rate, then yeah, you're gonna. You, I would encourage um, folks to, to to take more samples. Um, Blue, the Blue River, I'll show you some pictures of, so that gives you a sense of, 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 of how the flow rates, and I'll, I'll show you some of the discharge volumes so that you can have you know, a sense of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about high flow. Um, okay. One more question. How yep. are you right filtering here. and what type of filter? Yep, right here. Perfect. So we are using um, nitrocellulose membranes um, that we extract on these. Um, we have a number of these these metal, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what's called them, apparatus, you know, membrane holders, I guess, funnels, um, and we autoplate these every time before we use them, and we're taking, you know, 10 samples, usually 10 or fewer samples from, from any trip, um, and so we stick the membranes in here, um, and uh, sometimes we'll stack, uh, like, a, a, another membrane on top, like a one micron filter, if it's really turbid, um, and that's just because there's sometimes there's so much sediment that you know you can't get a good um, flow rate or filtration. Um, your 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 filter will just clog, you know, 500 mils in or even like 100 mils in, just because you know the, 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 there's so much sediment or so much organic matter or whatever is in the creek. So um, it can be useful to stack it, and then keep in mind the stacked piece, the one micron. We then we don't we do not extract from. So We'll take that one micron filter and just throw it away. Um, and, and what we're looking for is, you know, the smaller, you know, the smaller debris, the smaller organic matter for the extraction. Um, this has worked well for us, so this is, you know, this is the way we do it. We then take this, this example, the filters down here is what they look like after you filtered them. Um, we take these and we'll, we might put them in the freezer and put them in these little petri dishes to just, you know, keep stuff from falling on them and so forth. Um, we put them in the freezer and then we extract them usually the next day because the, the students will tell you they're, they're, they're beat after a day of sampling and then driving back and then filtering until, you know, 10 o'clock at night. So um, this is usually how we do it. Uh, then once they're filtered, we, we check the concentrations, um, you know, with a spectrophotometer. We're using the power what was formerly power water kaijin you know obviously thought out more bio um, I don't know if anyone's had um, a decrease in eDNA extraction efficiencies we have um, I would call it kaijin they said nothing really has changed but I think the mobile kits work better when they were owned by kaijin so um, we found that those really work well they have a um, a bead a silica bead step that allows you to shred these these filters so so we'll take these filters Put them in the in the bead shredding uh, tubes that come with these kits, and 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 you know, uh, shake them, vibrate them according to the protocol, and then we that's that's how that's we're extracting it from that shredded material. Um, <clears throat> the next step we have, uh, next step we do for our process is we use uh, DDPCR. We have a 2x200. Um, we started out as, as I showed you from that earlier graph. We started out using um, the Applied Biosystem 7500. We still sometimes use that, but generally we stick to stick digital droplets, just a superior uh, way of doing quantitative PCR. Um, this is, if you're not familiar how they work, there's a three step process where you have to make uh, droplets uh, from a master mix of PCR. You then cycle those droplets, and then this machine reads them. So the advantage of digital droplet PCR is that you're instead of taking one bulk measurement where you can have missed primes and things interacting that you don't want to interact, and you create um, femtoliter discrete reactions, and that's kind of shown here, these little bubbles where are supposed to be like individual reactions. So that, that's what you're doing with DDPCR, you're taking a bulk reaction and create, creating discrete small reactions that limit um, interactions of, of nonspecific targets. So it's, that, that's kind of the advantage. And um, you can get down to one microliter, or sorry, one copy per microliter, which is you know, an amazing resolution. 
um, in, in terms of PCR. So this is a typical result that we will get from some of these. Um, so th these are negative droplets down here. Um, these are positive droplets. Um, this is a little bit like qPCR in that you know you, you establish a threshold, a cutoff. Um, so the fluorescence in these uh, tiny droplets, which you can kind of shown here, are, are, are your positives and these are your negatives, and this is how you count um, your your copies. So this is this was something we're showing for um, our oh, our, our amplicon made from clean up 503 products. So our primer steps, we have two steps, right? We have an amplification of a 503 base pair product, and then we do a nested PCR of this cleaned up product. So I want to be, I want to be very clear about that. <clears throat> We're doing a PCR of a PCR, <clears throat> and um, that gives us greater specificity, that gives us um, greater sensitivity. Uh, the, the, the difficult, obviously, it's, it's multiple reactions. Um, and in our DD PCR, we're using this first round of cleaned up template as our template. So this is this 508 product is derived from the eDNA. So, but we don't actually. This is only an intermediate for the most part. We we don't um, use it uh, very often because be, most of them because it's not it's not uh, a perfect band. We'll get smears. We'll get some things. But the nested is what makes it, um, it makes that cleans it up, and makes it more specific, and, and gives us a nice tight band. Um, Blue River. Uh, this was it's one of our case studies. This we had the the very fortunate experience to work with um, Dr. Rod Williams at, at uh, Purdue. He he was um, in the process of releasing some some tag animals for telemetry. Um, and we were able to, uh, you know, follow his team and, and do some sampling, and then go back, you know, um, over the course of months. And we repeated this over a few years to 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 the same location. Um, and the advantage to this, obviously, I recognize Blue River is not in Ohio, but but it, it, it was um, useful because we had, um, you know, geotagged animals um, that we initially could 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 try to, to try to follow. Um, so I'm showing you two pictures in the front. This is somebody you know asked about the flow rates. This is here an example of the river at a non-detect. So we knew animals were there, but we were not able to detect the animals um, when the river looked like this. Uh, we were able to detect it when the river looked like this. So you can see this has uh, got a significantly higher, um, you know, more turbid appearance. But we can quantify that. I'll show you with. Um, with flow discharge and from USGS data. So this is um, Rod's team here um, doing some telemetry. Um, we went uh, a number of different times. Uh, the data I'm going to show you is from three separate trips. Um, the first one, when the river conditions were very nice, we're, you know, obviously we got a number of hits. Follow-ups were negative, and, and, and one of the main contributing factors was um, water conditions. Um, the positive samples that we were able to derive from the Blue River, we then were able to sequence. Um, we got a very nice section of DNA from this. We were actually able to get the whole 500 base pair section for sequencing, which which was which was great. Um, very often we only get that nested product that we can use, which is closer to 200 base pairs. Um, these are all Sanger sequences, um, Sanger reads. So these are either directly from PCR. I don't think these were plasma libraries. I think maybe Megan can answer that. But these were these were all derived from. We, we were able to, to sequence the PCR product, so it was clean enough, and you know a singular product, so that we were able to, to sequence it directly from from the PCR product. This is the result. So we had we did uh, some of these sites multiple times just to see if we could get you know through you know any information, any multiple animals. Um, all of these base calls, if there's, you know, if there's a change in a base here, these were, we, we went into the base calling software and looked at these, and these were shown to be the same. So any of the, these, any of the base calls here that are different were, were actually, these were incorrect base calls. And that's something you do need to do um, manually base call some of these SMPs because they may not be real SMPs. You got to go in and look at the results and then maybe run it again. So, one thing that stood out to us on this result um, were, you know, these these uh, first two sites had this, essentially the same sequence, 
But this site five, which is shown here on the right, um, right here, this was, this had a sequence that amplified it, and it was definitely different from the rest. So these base calls were correct. It had an insertion here. Um, it made me wonder if it was so different that this, you know, was a different salamander altogether. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of information on the D loop of, of um, you know, some of the other salamanders that, uh, that could be present in the area. So, you know, I think one thing that will help this strategy in general will be building up a library of, of you know, D loop region for these, for these animals um, as a reference. Um, but this was definitely different from these two animals. So this was, you know, a, uh, at least if these are the same, potentially the same, this was definitely a second animal. And the reason I say potentially the same is because this first sampling site shown in site one, we see the concentration drop off down here. So the story we're, you know, telling ourselves is, you know, that the concentration is decreasing, but it's the same sequence. So we're, you know, we're potentially assuming that we're, we're moving away from the animal, um, you know, based on the concentration decrease. Um, so the concentration here, this is, this is, sorry, I should have told you, this is the red line here. Um, this is the, the 503, quantitative 503 product here. So at site two, um, you know, we're basically not detecting it, we're not detecting it, then we detect it again. So there's a period of time where we're not detecting anything from the animal. So we're assuming, you know, maybe here this is a, is a new animal. Um, and site five, we get a very different animal. So we know that this animal and this animal are different based just on this sequence here. Um, and then at site six, we, we get an increase in concentration. So obviously, you know, water doesn't really flow upstream. You know, there's hundreds of feet between these samples, so this is a new animal here. Um, so those are those are the results for Blue River. This was a very nice kind of case study. We were able to get this to work with Sanger, which is inexpensive. Um, and then uh, future sequencing was not so lucky, but we did try a high throughput um, sequencing that that did work. So I'll show you that in a minute here. Oh, um, I got a few minutes. Hopefully everyone will let me go over. I apologize. The the river flow rates uh, for the Blue River were um, are shown here. This is when we had positive hits. Um, this is when we went back. So we went after a big rain event here. This is as soon as we could get out there. Um, this we went after. We're hoping for a low you know lower discharge. So this is um, in cubic feet per second. This is from the USGS. Um, these were both negative. No hits on these. So this was. Um, Presumed to either be due to temperature, where you know the, the, it got a lot colder in October, um, or the flow rates had um, you know made the animals kind of crawl into their their burrows and, and be a little bit more dormant. Um, one thing I'll touch on this, I you know I only say bring this up because it may be valuable to other folks, but it, you know this was something that that I think Chris you know Chris wisely steered us back towards you know the sequencing. We were kind of getting into the weeds on on some rainavirus work, um, we were just trying to figure out a long, a long range detection mechanism um, that is not to say this long range detection uh, target would tell you if hellbenders were there or not. This would only be, you know, the only purpose of this was to indicate if you should then do another, you know, 503, you know, mitochondrial PCR. So, it wasn't something where we were expecting our long-range indicator to tell us presence absence. This was only to indicate or, you know, do we have increased likelihood that we should detect or we, we should do sampling, that for, you know, further sampling for hell vendors in that region. So that was the goal. We talked to uh, Rod about using um, some different bacterial targets. They had been doing some work on the microbiome. I was hoping that there might be a unique bacteria on their surface that we could use. Um, that was not the case. Um, so the next and more abundant target, um, as everyone I think knows in the attendee panel, is you know viruses. So the only thing more abundant than microbes in you know surface waters are viruses. And so we targeted the the rainavirus, and um, this is an you know something that infects amphibians. Um, 
we I developed I designed three different primer sets for this. Um, again, totally experimental. Um, I used rainaviruses that were reported to infect amphibians to develop my primer set. They were reported in our final report if you want to try them out. Um, this uh, we tried these out and we were able to get um, some correlation. So the yellow line is this, and it says amphibian specific rainavirus. It's you know amphibian related. It's not specific to this. In fact, we sequenced this product and it gave us unknown viral sequences. So maybe this is a new rainavirus. I don't really know. It was kind of, um, but we did find that the that the concentration did was higher and did seem to kind of follow. Um, this, in this particular uh, creek or river, we tried the rainavirus primer sets in other locations. Um, we got a lot of no hits, and the virus replication is temperature dependent. So we did find that we got almost nothing when we went back. So you can see the green line, 13 degrees C here, nothing, no, no viral replication, or at least no virus detected. So that was interesting. Um, but we we tried this primer set at other creeks, and we we didn't really get it to work. So um, I, I do, you know, want other people to try it out if they think it might be useful as, a, as an indicator. Um, but I think, yeah, as I said, Chris wisely steered us towards um, some of the sequencing that we were doing. Here's some really short fragments that we were getting from blasts. Um, again, I, I think grain of salt with these folks, it, it, this was not um, something that I, I think it, 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 it may be working, but I don't, I don't want to um, convince you that rainavirus is the, is the is the next long range indicator. I think it was useful, but 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 needs more work. So down here, I said more development required. Um, quick list of creeks that we tried. Um, I think there was a few that might be missing, um, that multiple attempts that we didn't put on the list, but this was generally where, where we tried. Um, we got a few hits. The Jellaway Creek is the last case study I'll give you. Blue River worked very nicely. Um, Salt Creek is listed uh, here in 2018. Uh, as, a, as a as a no, we went back to Salt Creek, same animal location, and we weren't able to pick it up. So, but this, I'll tell you what, this was this was after we had um, a huge rain event. We we went there in the spring, and it, the Salt Creek was just completely blown out. It was it was very silty, very um, very high. And by very high, I'm, I mean it was probably four or five feet higher at the time um, than it was when we first sampled it. So, um, that back in uh, in 2016 here. Um, I'll, I'll go over this really quickly. We developed a, what we call the likelihood analysis. What we were doing, we were just trying to come up with a, a non-sampling way to see if we could rank the likelihood of finding an animal at these locations. Um, you know, this is an entirely new idea, but this, we made this specific to Ohio. Um, we used the discharge data, where it was located, water quality. Um, these are parameters uh, we use from the US EPA. And um, location was in your farmland, so potentially silt runoff, that kind of thing. So we use these factors. Um, this presentation will be available on the web, so um, I apologize, I have to go fast. But these were the, the locations we looked at. Um, we ranked them based on um, some of the EPA data, the water quality, as I mentioned, and we picked five, or sorry, four sites um, from this ranking, and we um, were able to get a detect on one of these. So the whole point of this exercise was to test our method of detection and sequencing on a new location without having any knowledge of where the animals were, um, no tips from Greg or, you know, or Rod. And so we, we selected locations and then we were actually able to pick up animals um, at Jellaway Creek. Jellaway Creek looks like this. This was, we went here twice. These are multiple locations. We uh, we found this is funny. We found this after we had selected it, so then we thought this you know our our, our fortunes had aligned. But um, we did actually detect animals in this creek, and I think one of the reviewers of the report had mentioned that you know it's called the Hellbender Preserve, but there's there's you know they're not sure there are animals there. Well, we, we found some animals there. So. Um, the Delaware Creek results. Um, this is our PCR of our nested. These were the, the, the copies for microliter. Now keep in mind, this never drops down to zero, right? And remember, we're using the 503 nested template as our product. So 
you know, very small amounts can then, you know, still be giving us hundreds of copies just because we're using that cleaned up uh, first round template. Um, so we do lose, I think, a little bit of information on, on, on uh, you know, concentration. Um, so diluted, uh, moved on to plasmid library. So we, we tried PCR products that did not work. We tried plasmid libraries. That was also problematic. Um, this was our sequencing results from our PCRs. You can see there's there's multiple you know sequences overlapping here. This is not usable information. Maybe JC13 is giving us uh, a good spot. So this is uh, JC13 here. And um, so we tried something new. We tried uh, extra nanopore sequencing. Um, I would be the first to tell you that that I uh, I for years did not put a lot of faith in nanopore sequencing. Um, big face calling is the big problem with big nanopore sequencing. Um, it's improved a lot, <clears throat> so we tried it out, and um, we were, I was pretty happy with the results. Best practices gives you 7 to 12 percent error. Um, we had a cutoff much higher than that, um, so that we would eliminate errors, um, potential errors from the sequencing. Um, this is my student Megan. She's hopefully on this call or this webinar. Um, this is our sequencer, so this can actually this is portable. This you can bring this out in the field if you actually can do your extractions out there um, at all. If you can do your filtration and your extraction, um, and this will sequence in real time. So you you put your sample on here, and then you can actually watch these little green squares represent DNA going through the nanopore. So it, it sequences it and you can kind of watch it do it. Um, the 200 base pair product, here's a PCR of that. You can see there's, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little bit of, you know, big faints here. You can see that in the sequencer. So the reads that you get out pick up some of the non-specific product, which, I, which is really great because that actually, you can eliminate these easily by um, using a, a, you know, just a size cutoff. Um, and then you align, you know, makes your job easier. You can align this peak to your reference and see if it's actually, you know, your target. So we used uh, the mitochondrial genome accession numbers here as our reference. Um, we created a BAM file, which is how you can uh, merge, um, you know, genomic data. Uh, we used IGD tools as the reference analysis to, uh, software. <clears throat> this is what we got. Um, really just a quick, easy reference. These coded, lines at the top tell you deviations from the reference sequence. So this one, five major deviations. And to give you a sense of how many reads we're talking about, how much information we're getting from this, we're getting um, over 100,000 reads. So that means there's 100,000, more than this, so 150 or 120,000 reads. And so, and this includes both strands. So we're getting a minimum of, of 50,000 reads per, you know, so strands of DNA going through these nanopores. Um, so this is, a, this is a huge amount of data. And um, we're able to uh, basically remove everything that's, that's um, infrequent. And um, we picked up some interesting SMPs. This one, 15974, we don't fully understand. Is this you know, multiple animals? Could this be something that was, you know, a mutation? You know, because this was a, this was a G, you know, GC location. Cytosine methylation is that drawing us off? Um, heteroplasmy, so in one animal with multiple mutations. This is, it's not clear to me what this is at this point. This is kind of new data, but um, reference sequence and then the, 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 the SMPs we were picking up. And um, you can see, you know, for our selection here, we have, you know, this one is 75% deviation from the, the normal base call. So, and, and also keep in mind we're sequencing both strands. So um, this is just like a paired end read in, in Illumina. We're getting 50,000 reads in, in, in both directions. Um, and this is just for one site. So we did this at the downstream site and we picked up a new mutation here. Um, so again, you can just count the bars. One, two, three, four, five, six. The other one has five. So you can see that this is definitely a different animal. Um, just simply based on this new mutation. And um, you know, this is, this cutoff is a little lower, but um, we're, we're, we still have this weird, oh, sorry, gene mutation, um, and uh, and what we're you know unsure of is is what this means at this point. Um, we're still trying to understand it, but um, you see this at both sites, 
this the concentrations slightly change, but this might be, you know, I expect this to be within the margin of error of the instrument. So 57, and then this this one goes up. So are these multiple animals with these different mutations? This one is closer. You know, I, I don't think so. I think I'm thinking these are um, there might be two animals, and and one has some heteroplasmy. I'm not I'm not sure though. So the good news though is there's information to be found in these sequencing results of the D loop and it can um, help us discriminate uh, animals in, in the field. Um, a couple more things, samples to considerations, if you, if you need to do this um, as a detection method, um, I think nanopore sequencing can be a huge help. I think I encourage others to do this. It's relatively inexpensive. Once you get the min-ion is, is, uh, instrument itself, it's is, is cheap. For the price of an Illumina run, you can buy this whole setup and run you know, six sequencing runs. So, I would encourage others to try it out if you haven't. Um, relatively consistent low flows are, are really essential. Um, rain events, flooding, high flow rates, we, we, have, we have trouble getting um, results, uh, the text, I should say. Uh, seasonal variation, we found like other groups that, you know, September, August, those were really good times to, to pick, the, pick up the animals. Water quality was important. Um, you know, can you pick up an animal in January? Um, well, first of all, I wouldn't recommend going out onto the creeks with the ice. You might fall in and slip in. And, um, but I would say generally, no, it's going to be very difficult to detect an animal um, using the eDNA in, in the winter because the animals are, well, are dormant and, and um, there's not a lot of um, a lot of metabolic happenings. Um, while observed, uh, D loop region had low SP diversity. Um, we were able to get distinct animal sequences, and I think what's going to help us is a database of the D loop region, and, and, and we can have kind of a library similar to what people are creating with the Green Sea Turtle. Um, so that's uh, the end of my talk. I appreciate um, the advice of uh, Chris and Marcy during this, the, this project. They were invaluable. They were very helpful. Um, uh, also indebted to Greg and Pete uh, for helping us um, with, uh, you know, getting some positive control and, you know, just kind of wel welcoming, welcoming us into the fold. Um, Greg is a really great guy and, and, and was, you know, we're coming from environmental engineering. We're not pure biologists. And I, I thought that was great that, you know, we kind of, we kind of were included very quickly. And then Rod Williams um, at Purdue, his group was, was, was a huge help at the beginning, helping us on the Blue River, letting you know, us swab his animals um, before they were released. Um, yeah, so, um, and finally, I couldn't have done this work without the students. Um, Dave McCullough started uh, the, the first, he did some of the first primer development work, um, or I should say the PCRs. The endless PCRs were done by David, um, Megan, did the sequencing, the most recent sequencing. Um, she was a huge help. Um, Justin did a lot of sampling, and, and so did Jared. So um, that's it uh, for the Thank talk. You, Dr. Um, yeah. We appreciate your time, and I know that we've ran a bit over, but we've had a good contingency of stayed on with us. Mm -hmm. I'll be emailing you the additional questions that came in in respect of the um, time. The, and the fact that we ran over a bit. So everyone will be getting a certificate of attendance, so we'll make certain that we have the additional time on there for your CPD credits. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Wendell, and to your team, and we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up now. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Take care. Okay.